It's been an incredible journey, lots of things to learn, and hopefully some insights that could be, could be useful. And as uh, was just mentioned, uh, we'll have some time for Q&A uh, in the end as well. Quickly about what we do, and it kind of puts the premise for some of these learnings uh, that I'll share in a minute. Antler is a company that is built on the belief that great founders will come from anywhere, whether it is a, an emerging ecosystem or an established ecosystem for venture capital. And that's led us to create uh, individual teams across very established hubs like New York, London, big ecosystems in the Nordics like Copenhagen, obviously, and Stockholm, but also in places like Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam or Bangalore in India or Nairobi in Kenya. In 2013, there were 37 cities that had one or more unicorns. Now the number is over 200. And we're seeing with more access to information, capital, talent, people being more uh, mobile in where they work, uh, you can truly build a great company from any ecosystem. That's led us to create a very big structure for investing quite systematically in startups. And we've had the pleasure of working with now more than 7,000 entrepreneurs across all of these different markets. These companies are building across all kinds of technologies. It's in uh, prop tech, it's in energy, healthcare. We're really trying to be industry agnostic, so we're not limiting what founders can build. We're trying just to figure out how can we create the best possible start for them to create something truly special. You see some examples here on this, uh, on this page. I'll spend 30 seconds explaining our model because it's important for how we learn about entrepreneurs from this very early stage. We call this model for day zero investing. And what we're essentially doing is talking to thousands, actually 110,000 applicants every year. We're talking to thousands of these to figure out, do they have something special and can we work with them in our office to try to create founder teams together with them around strong business models. So we bring in a lot of people, work with them for three to six months, uh, and then we make our first ticket into their companies, and we follow on in the later rounds as they scale. Some of the companies that have come out of this uh, includes Aerolo, which is a global eSIMS marketplace created by Bahadir here in 2019 in Singapore. It's now in over 200 countries and regions. Highly recommend if you're uh, tired of paying for expensive roaming. And here in the Nordics, one example is Trade. It's a B2B um, fintech platform, making it a lot easier for a flat fee to uh, handle some of your working capital requirements towards suppliers. And maybe just the last example to illustrate some of these companies is HomeThings, which is an environment-friendly eco brand for um, cleaning products, replacing big bottles with a lot of liquid, a lot of waste, a lot of plastic waste with smaller tablets that you can use to refill uh, environmentally friendly bottles. So as you can see from these examples, it's, it's really all over the place and it's really for founders who are looking to innovate in almost any type of industry. Now, what are some of the learnings that we have made from this journey uh, across all of these different markets and industries? I wanted to bring up four things. Uh, one is that we're really seeing that change is happening faster and faster, both for early stage companies and, and bigger ones. Now is the time to build. We really believe that it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. We're also seeing a lot about what constitutes the right founder type to be successful as an entrepreneur. And lastly, we're becoming more and more diverse as an ecosystem, both here in the Nordics, in Europe, and globally when it comes to who are building companies, which is great. If we double click on the first one, I always like slides like this because it really puts into perspective how change is happening. Uh, a famous one that I've uh, seen many times is, is that it took the airline industry 50 years to get 50 million users, and it took Pokemon Go uh, 19 days. If you look at this one, you see that it took Netflix 3.5 years to get 1 million users. And uh, OpenAI took five days. Threads, obviously one hour, but it helps when you have a one billion Facebook platform uh, behind you. So maybe it shouldn't be on this list. But this is also important for early stage entrepreneurs. It shows that you can really get quite critical scale and you can iterate and you can get the feedback from the market much faster than before because people are more connected and uh, the cost of doing uh, uh, market testing, cost of launching a company is going down quite rapidly year over year. I mentioned now is the time to build, and what I mean there is 
stop reading all the negative headlines. I think if you're starting a company today, you shouldn't worry if uh, the Series C funding environment in healthcare in San Francisco is down X percent. It's very easy to put everything that is happening in VC and startups and uh, put it into one simple story. The fact of the matter is, it's always going to be a pendulum between the investor and the entrepreneur. Uh, that weight is sort of shifting back and forth. I think during the boom years a few years ago, there was a lot of power in the hands of the founder. Uh, now, obviously, it's a little bit shifted to the investor. But as an entrepreneur, that shouldn't really be uh, where your focus is. If you want to build a company, it's still great. It's a lot of people who, who are there to support you. And that can be backed up if you look at uh, this slide with uh, the financial crisis. You see that right before, during, and also right after, some of the really monumental companies of our time was created during this, uh, this challenging time in, in the financial world. So there's no excuse and you shouldn't sit and wait for a better time to build a company because quite frankly, by the time your company gets to the later stages, the, the market will look very different anyway. So now is the time to build. When it comes to what we are seeing that works for founders, uh, there's been a lot of learnings from having now had hundreds and you know, tens of thousands of interviews with people across, um, across the world. We're seeing really three traits that are very highly correlated with the most successful companies that we have. I think that the people I showed on the screen earlier, uh, they definitely have a lot of these uh, skill sets. One is this drive. I think that it's just impossible to replace uh, hard work, discipline, and, and putting in the hours and hustling like crazy, especially during the first couple of years. It's perhaps not surprising, but, but that's definitely something we're seeing. Second thing is around spike. I think that founders don't have to and probably shouldn't be the best at everything, but we do see a strong correlation with people who have a strong spike in, in one or more areas where they are truly better than 99.9% .9 of the population. You can be a great salesperson, you can be very deep in your domain, or you can just be incredible at building teams and, and leading a company. You can't be the best at everything, but really spike individuals have something they bring to the table. I think the last thing is around grit. It's incredibly hard to build a company, and uh, you know, the statistics are not on your side. Uh, so you really need to do a lot of things. You need to get very used to facing a lot of adversity. You need to be quite irrational in your belief that this company will succeed. If you start losing belief, definitely everyone else is starting to lose belief. So as much as possible, you know, if you have this irrational belief that you will succeed no matter what, uh, we see that that's obviously very highly correlated with the companies that succeed uh, that we have had the chance to work with. I'll kind of double down on that a bit. I, I like this front load hustle, failure is not an option type of saying. And if we think about it, the two first years, you have to hustle like crazy. And we really see companies that do that, they end up with, uh, with a good scenario very often. 0.7% of startups typically are able to raise VC capital from, from kind of bigger players. Around 8% of companies that uh, have been raising uh, capital end up successful. You're really down to kind of one in 2,000 to think about starting a company, making it big. So you need to be able to get no's into yeses, whether you're hiring team members, whether you are uh, looking for investors, or you're, you're trying to prove to customers that they should pay for your product. It's very hard if you don't have this hustle mentality, and you know, you're, if you don't have the capability to turn no's into yeses to, to build a great company. And very closely linked to that is having this failure is not an option mentality as much as you can. Final point on the learnings from having been on this journey now with a thousand companies uh, is around diversity. Here I'll kind of double click a bit on Europe. And we're seeing, uh, if we look at the 387 unicorns that were created in Europe between 2000 and 2023, that there were only 4% um, uh, women founders in, uh, in that group. Obviously, just a terrible statistic. But we are seeing that things are improving. And if we look at uh, what we have in the middle here called Europe uh, Aspiring Founders, that's essentially the data set from 72,000 applications we've received in Europe for Antler. We see that a quarter of them um, are women founders. So that's a great step in the right direction. And out of this group, the ones that we have worked with, uh, it's 33% women founders. It's obviously still not where the ecosystem should be, but perhaps because of the early stages that uh, we are working in, this can be foreshadowing what's going to come uh, 
later in the ecosystem with many, many more women founders. Uh, the second thing on uh, diversity uh, that I wanted to bring up is around nationalities. I think that uh, it's really mind-boggling what we're seeing with our founders now, that there's over 150 nationalities that have applied to build companies with Antler. It's just a massive shift. Obviously, it means that people are really coming from almost all over the world to build companies in Europe. I think there's lots to be said about building a company in the Nordics. Uh, the south of Europe obviously has some great benefits as well. London is a big hub. Berlin, of course. So these ecosystems are increasingly attracting uh, global talent and, and, and people from all over the place. That's significantly up from 39 nationalities who are behind these 387 unicorns that I mentioned earlier. I think that one kind of uh, learning that I wanted to summarize with before opening up for Q&A, um, or three actually, is uh, now is the time to build. I want to emphasize that again. You know, don't, uh, don't lose faith from re reading that uh, maybe there's less capital or, or you know, uh, difficult times in, in the financial markets. If you believe you should build, you shouldn't you know, um, hold on and, uh, and not do that. Uh, the second thing is that people are really coming from all over the world to build companies. If you don't feel that you're matching the right demographic or the right uh, geography or you don't have the right network, I would not keep that as an excuse. We have seen both from these numbers and many other things uh, happening in the ecosystem that founders can truly come from anywhere. We back people in their 60s, we back people in their teens, everyone in between, and there's no perfect uh, time to build, there's no wrong time to build, and, and that's truly important to, uh, to believe. And I think thirdly as well that there is a lot of things happening both in this ecosystem here in Copenhagen, but also broadly across Europe and the world where more and more people are uh, really focusing their models on being very uh, supportive of founders in the beginning. And that's obviously a lot of what we are all about as well. I think the hardest part of building a company is really those first couple of years. It can be a very lonely journey, but as we get more players and more capital into this part of the ecosystem, I think it can truly open up for, for many, many more entrepreneurs. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll take questions and uh, hopefully people are feeling inspired. Thank you. I'm getting one question here on the most exciting market um, Antler is investing in. I think the markets we are in are obviously very different in terms of what uh, the strengths and the weaknesses in the markets. Um, I'm incredibly excited about many, but uh, if, if pushed for an answer, I, I think that what's happening in uh, India now is incredible. It's so many people who are starting companies, we're in investing there at a very high rate, and it feels like there's a bit of a shift where before it was maybe very important to be a doctor or a lawyer or a traditional um, career uh, in, in families in India. I think that's, that is shifting a bit and people are opening their eyes uh, to what can be achieved by being an entrepreneur. So we're seeing a lot of people now making that shift in, in obviously one of the world's uh, biggest uh, markets. Uh, why do you typically pass on companies and founders? I think it comes down to, for us at least, given that we are very early stage, uh, it comes down to not being convinced that the team uh, or the individuals have what it takes for, uh, for this to be a success. It matters much more to us, given that we are at this day zero investing stage, that the team has a, a lot of potential. It matters much more than uh, what exactly the business idea is. I think when you do pre-seed investing, one thing you know for sure is that uh, the company is... Uh, uh, is going to uh, pivot their business model many, many times. And uh, if, you, um, if you're focusing too much on exactly what's coming out um, when you're investing at that stage, you, you, you know, you're in for, for a couple of surprises. Uh, getting another one here on uh, founders' mental health as a topic in Antler. How do you ensure it uh, for the founders of your portfolio companies? I think it is an important topic, of course. Um, it's something we talk about quite a bit uh, during these three to six months where we have entrepreneurs in our office. So it's definitely important for people to uh, keep it in mind. I mentioned one of the learnings, right, with Drive, that 
There's no substitute for working incredibly hard uh, when you're starting a company. But that obviously means you need to make some very tough choices. And uh, sometimes if you try to do it all, it can seriously impact uh, you know, both your physical and mental health. So you know, without spending too, too much time on this, I think that is uh, an incredibly important thing for teams to talk about uh, with each other. Obviously, you need to have the right investors who don't, who don't kind of look at uh, the journey in a completely different way. Uh, I think on the ESG topic, uh, it's a very big focus uh, here in the Nordics, for example. A lot of um, impact uh, capital has gone into a lot of our companies and, and, and some of the fund structures we have. Um, one thing we are doing with ESG uh, more broadly is that we're trying to set companies up for tracking this in a very systematic way, even from the stage where there are two or three people. And the reason for that is, as they scale, this will definitely be a requirement for a lot of their follow-on investors that you know what are your targets, what are you tracking, and what is your impact on the broader world. So I tell founders whether or not you think it's important, it's going to be important for your fundraising later. So it's almost a no-brainer to set yourself up for, for tracking in a very good way. Yeah, I think a company, does a company, um, SaaS company, uh, need to have a CTO? Uh, you invest in needs to have a CTO, or is it a broad tech, broad team sufficient? It's hard to say. It really comes down to the business model. Uh, I'll give a short answer here, which is definitely get in touch with our team and, and talk about it uh, to figure out what, what's the right answer for you. Um, what advice would you give yourself when you were early 20s? I think that one thing that is very different from 10 years ago or, or definitely 20 years ago is uh, having worked in a startup or having started a company and failed, I think, looks uh, looks quite good on your CV if you're able to articulate what you learned and maybe why you failed and what you would have done differently. 10 or 20 years ago, I, I, I think that it was much more, oh, you went the startup direction, it didn't work. Now, don't, don't come back into the more traditional job market. I think there's a very different mentality now, especially if you've achieved a few milestones. So I would translate that into definitely trying to build a, um, a company uh, or join a startup quite early. I wouldn't necessarily have this timeline of only doing that when I'm late 20s or 30s. Uh, joining a startup, I think there's uh, never a bad uh, decision if you believe in the team and the people behind it. Uh, if you pass on a founder or team but like their idea, do you ever build another team to work on that idea? I think it's a good question because we are obviously facing a lot of ideas and facing a lot of teams. Ideas typically at this very early stage are cheap, uh, but putting in the hard work uh, is not meaning that uh, there will be a lot of very similar ideas floating around in the ecosystem. Obviously, for anyone who are in this Antler journey, uh, we try to focus on having a very open environment for talking about ideas, but we don't put different people in different uh, ideas. But what could happen, which we do quite often, is to try to nudge people in the direction of each other, because the great thing about our model is we're seeing so many people so many um, people who might be a good fit who don't know each other. So I like this example in the Nordics. We've even put people from Sweden and Denmark together who didn't know each other, and they formed a, a good company because that team was kind of missing something complementary. So, so that, that's kind of how we, we look at uh, the, the area around ideas. Um, I'll do a final one. I say I have 25 seconds. So B2C versus B2B and why? I think it is... Uh, very hard to, to answer. I, I think it's quite hard to build a B2C company, so just make sure you have a very good idea. Uh, it's maybe less sexy with B2B companies, but uh, if you get it right there, it can be quite sticky. Just, uh, just make sure you, you are aware of the long uh, sales cycles. That's two seconds left. Uh, thank you very much.